Good afternoon and welcome to the council. I am your host, Charlie Pichello, and I uh, just have a really exciting show here for you today. So excited to be with you. It's been a couple of weeks since I've been here. And I uh, just want to make a quick shout out to our um, sponsor, Remax Alliance. Remax Alliance, uh, if you want to buy a home in Colorado, go to www.homesincolorado.com. That's homesincolorado.com. I've known these guys for years uh, with the high school or something. And uh, they are fantastic. These guys are amazing. They have integrity. Honestly, you want to buy your dream home, you want to buy your, your, you want to sell your home, whatever. These are the people that are the best in Colorado, the best um, people that I know who can give you uh, the, the home that you've always wanted. So go to www.homesincolorado.com. That's homesincolorado.com. Uh, also, I'm going to be presenting uh, at this event called the 5D Events. Uh, it's going to be in Las Vegas. On April 19th through the 21st, uh, it's a five day event. It's for uh, our planet. I'm going to be one of the speakers on the panel. You can go to my website or my Facebook page and you'll be able to find all the information about the event. There's going to be some great speakers there. It's about business, about spirituality, about higher consciousness, about bringing the planet together. And you're going to meet some amazing, amazing people doing some incredible work in the world. And so go to 5devents.com. That's 5devents.com. And uh, also, if you would like to work with me, I'm giving an offer right now for those who uh, you know, have seen my work. I, I do a lot of work with people with PTSD, depression, trauma, helping couples recover from emotionally and psychologically abusive relationships, and also helping parents to uh, set parenting plans for their children. So if you want to uh, work with me, please uh, send me a message on my emails. That's charlespacello.com. That's C-H-A-R-L-E-S-P-A-C-E-L-L-O at gmail.com. Uh, and just put in the, in the, in the subject line, uh, help me, Charlie. Help, help me, Charlie. Charlie. Help help me Charlie. And Charlie. I'll, I'll give you help me, Charlie. <laughs> help me, Charlie. I should have done that. <laughs> <laughs> and so do that. Send it to me. And uh, the first 15 minutes, I'll free. So. That's uh, awesome. Yeah. You do great work, too. Oh, well, thank you. And I like your sponsor. It, it's really true about them. Oh, the they're, Alliance, they're awesome. <laughs> they're so amazing. Yeah. I mean, and the people there, they're, they're such a class of integrity. I know, they're great. And, uh, you know, they're, they're some of my best friends work there. And, uh, they're good I can, I can vouch for them. They are the best. So. And I'll say hi to Rick Nelson. Hi, Rick. I'm just something pop up on the screen. He goes, hi, what are Rick. you doing? He said, a surprise seeing you here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprising people. I just dropped by and say hi. Well, Ron is, I asked Ron if they come on to the show with me today because we're talking a little bit about some issues that uh, our, our, our country is dealing with. And I thought before we get into why uh, we're happy that maybe we could talk just a little bit about some about things, things making us unhappy. A little about <laughs> the things that are making us unhappy <laughs> and the things that uh, are coming. You know, we were just talking a little bit about some of the issues that are going on with the Catholic Church. You know, we were both uh, both reformed, reformed Catholics. Catholics. And uh, last year, I had actually had the opportunity, the incredible opportunity, to to meet with the Pope. Actually, that's amazing. Hands. He's a great guy. I do too. I think it's wonderful. Um, Best thing that's happened to the Church in decades. I think so too. I think the, and I think this is, uh, if anybody could handle this crisis in a, in a, in a way that is, that represents, uh, the people who were injured and doing right by them, this is the man. And otherwise, I just, I really don't know if the church is going to survive. It's pretty tough. It'll probably survive because it, you know, it's, it's global. It's not just within our, our country. But, yeah. But, um, you know, and I'll tell you, if anybody can make the church get through, it's going to be a Jesuit. That's true. <laughs> I worked at yeah. the Jesuit University and love the Jesuits. Yeah. The people, you know, work with the wonderful. So mm -hmm. not all, not all of the church has, you know, there's some systemic problems, but I wouldn't want anyone to think that, uh, every priest or every person involved mm -hmm. in the church is bad because they're not. There's some wonderful, wonderful, godly people involved with the religion. Yes. But unfortunately, you know, we can just create an environment that is not safe. Well, it has, and it's, and it's time that, uh, you know, the, the Catholic church is able to look at it and face it and deal with it in a way. That honors the, the children that were injured and that were raped, that were uh, sexually abused, and to uh, make amends. You know, one of the things that is so important in any type of uh, injustice like this, and this is a major injustice, and it has been covered up for a long time, 
than for people like us who were raised Catholic. I was you know, when I was confirmed my, my Catholic con- school and everything. <laughs> yeah, and my confirmation name is uh, St. Francis of Assisi. That was the name that I, that I took. And my mother's a devout Catholic. My family's a and so it pains us, my goodness, when we heard all these things that were happening. That was again that just rocked the, the, the foundation of the church again. It's like, what did they do to this, to Jesus' teachings? Because the teachings never said anything like that. Well, yeah, I know. You, you sit there and you wonder sometimes, and, and certainly I'm not an expert in that, but, you know, I, I think that what happened, I mean, one, one of the things I think we were talking about earlier is that when you have an environment where you create a safety net for pedophiles, Mm-hmm. And, and by what I mean is, they handled it themselves. They kept it internal. Whether that was right or wrong, they kept it internal. They kept it away from the police. Yeah. I'm not saying they're doing that today. But what happens is, those people that are drawn to that evil, mm-hmm. what it is, mm-hmm. it's not a, it's an evil, those people that are drawn to that evil, then realize, hey, do I want access to children? Do I want access to this? Want, and where can I go where I'm protected, where I probably will never get arrested? I might get in trouble and sent away somewhere to a monastery in France, but I won't, but I won't, uh, or, you know, but yeah. I won't go to jail. Well, then what's going to happen is they're going to start applying and be entering that field. Mm-hmm. And that's why you have so many. I don't think it's, uh, I think it's left who's married. Oh, I think they, they, they could be selective and, and, and change that a lot. And a lot of people don't realize that the church didn't, when the church was first started, the, the priests were married. They didn't have families. They had, and it wasn't until like, and, I'm, and my history is a little off on this, but it's around 800 AD or something like that where they ended up. It was uh, the Dark Ages. The Dark yeah. Ages, yeah, where they implemented the, uh, the, Requirement that they remain chaste, that uh, that they couldn't, right. couldn't marry, couldn't have families, and there were multiple reasons for, for them wanting to do this, not just to keep us, uh, the priests uh, yeah. pure or anything like that. Well, and they had had um, it might have been the Borgias, but I can't remember because there was a family back in that country and older than that, mm-hmm. and the popes and everyone married and they had children. Yeah. And what was happening were the children of the, the priests and the, not necessarily the priests didn't even really have them, but the children of the, the cardinals and the bishops. And the abbots mm-hmm. and the pope were laying claim on the church lands. They were saying, "Okay, well, my dad was this, and he died now. It's mine." Mm-hmm. The church was like, "Ah, ah, ah, it's not yours. It's ours. It's ours. No, 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 uh-uh. <laughs> no. Sorry. Okay, we're going to end this because they, they kept having issues with that yeah. and thinking that they would, if, if the cardinal died, then the son would be the cardinal. Right. And that really, there wasn't a line of succession like that in church. So they said, "Well." What's the easiest way to end that? Okay, can't be married, then you can't have any legitimate children, and there's no legitimate claims against them. Yeah. So I think that was a big part of it. Right. All of it was people. Well, and it is. It's uh, it's also important to you know look at the fact that you know there's a, sometimes when people are in charge of other people's souls, they can come across as being elitist and uh, clericalism and all these things that are that are connected to it. And there needs to be a return. To what <clears throat> those Jesus teachings are all about, yep. which is humility, which is graciousness, which is compassion, which is love for your neighbor, loving your enemies, loving those things, and, and doing it not because you're expecting anything in return. And, and really giving them, I think you told that story, we were just talking about it, about one of your favorite story in the Bible. Oh, yes, yeah. yeah. I, my favorite story is uh, about the woman who's being stoned. Yeah. Yeah, because I think we missed, we missed the point. Uh, we all know that. You know, oh gosh, you without sin don't cast the first stone, right? Mm-hmm. And um, and I think that was an important part of the story. But I think the real part of that story was they, this woman when they drug her in front of Jesus, they drug her out of her sin, out of her bed, mm-hmm. which was in the act. They brought her. They brought her. They didn't bring the man, by the way. They brought her. <laughs> notice that. Um, yeah. you know, he was fine. They brought her. They were going to stone her. He said, "Stop!" But he never asked her, "Do you believe in me? Yeah. Do you have faith in me? Are you going to go on and be a follower of mine?" That wasn't the criteria to save this woman. Mm-hmm. The criteria to save this woman was it was wrong to do harm to her. It was wrong to judge another person. It's wrong for you to say, you know, hey, this was wrong when you're doing all kinds of things yourself wrong. Every, mm-hmm. it was a, I think it was a great example of everybody has their own uh, sin that they carry, and everybody uh, should be kind and gentle to each other and welcoming and inclusive. Absolutely. And that's where I think the story is. Yeah. Did you miss that point? Yep, I totally agree. And it's also important to understand that we can't really hold anybody accountable to anything unless you can hold yourself accountable to what you do. You've got to walk your walk, you've got to talk your talk, and to think that, you you know, you, you can go ahead and lie to somebody else, and then you get upset at somebody else who lies to you, you're fooling yourself. You've got to be able to be direct and say the truth, and, and this whole idea of being polite and stuff, when people are actually being 
honest and truthful and, and sincere about things. The people are <coughs> we're not familiar with that anymore. No, no we, yeah, we have not, become, yeah, not. we have been taught to deceive each other. Well, it's a pro- and, and it starts at the leadership and goes all the way down. It starts at the top. And it's been going on for a, a lot mm-hmm. of years. Mm-hmm. And I just really think it's important that uh, you know there's a lot of beautiful uh, Catholics out there, people that, that were injured yes. by this, that uh, you know need to uh, recognize that uh, you know there's there's a way to get out of it. And it's just about being honest and about being authentic and about being accountable. Yes. And, and, it's, really being and it's a beautiful religion. I have nothing against oh, it. I yeah, personally yeah. just found, you know, there are things in lives that enhance your ability to find that spiritual connection and things that detract from it. Mm-hmm. And if the, the, the religion or the church that you're going to detracts from that, then it's not good for you. It may be good for everybody else right. or another person because that might help them. You know, and uh, and so there's no, and, and I know wonderful Catholics that are very incredible people, including many, many priests. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I wouldn't want this to be construed as a bash the Catholic. No, thing. no, it's no, not. no. And it's not. No, I know, I know it's not true. Not at all. You great know. respect for them, but that's yeah. an area that they got to fix. Or it's gonna, it could take the whole church down. Absolutely. We just don't want to be a part of it anymore. That's right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and uh, this book, I sure hope you will. I hope you will. Because I think it's great. great. And you know, I have a, Shaking his hand and meeting I would have oh my god, it was just the, it was like my Forrest Gump moment. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, this is really happening to me. How is this happening? I mean, great man, great it's man, and, and all and about that. reconciliation and all about bringing people together yes. and truth. Yeah, and truth, yeah. and, and really, <clears throat> excuse me, trying to bring it back to the, the church, back to the principles of Jesus. Yep. Uh, a couple of before you, before uh, we talk about happiness, what do you think about this election? Look at how look how impactful how many women how yes. many women were elected this year. I, mean, I think it's absolutely incredible. What, what are, it's like the year of the woman. It is. I think I think that um, we've got a couple of things going for us that are really great. Uh, I think it's important to never have one party control everything. Mm-hmm. I would never want that. Not even mm-hmm. though I'm a reformed Republican as well. Yeah. <laughs> I was Republican for all my life until about two years ago. Yeah. So that's it. <laughs> People are nuts. <laughs> but, um, but um but mm-hmm. anyway, um I don't think that any one party should have complete control because yeah. every time that happens we the people get in trouble. Yes. You yeah. know. Uh, there needs to be checks and balances, that's what it was for. So mm-hmm. I'm very glad that we now have not one party control. Um, I do not wish for us to have complete control. I don't mm-hmm. think that that's advisable. I think we have to work together. And when we are forced to work together, then we can get through some of these things that are dividing us in the nation. Yeah. And having the women in there, that's awesome. I think so. Yeah. I think it's absolutely, I mean, you have this whole, you have uh, the first Muslim woman right. that was ever elected. Uh, is and, and, and I think a full blood Native American. Full blooded Native yeah, American is being required. I think it's absolutely mm-hmm. amazing. And I think, I mean, there's just all these different, we've risen up. And I think there's, there's a, I mean, we, we have a And people of into, color and yeah. you know, all backgrounds, men too. Yep. You know? And I think, that's, I, and both parties, no yes. matter if they're Republican yep. or Democrat, when we step up, step up and we're elected. And, you know, there'll be a day, I hope, that it will be so common to be so mm-hmm. mixed that you, that we won't have a conversation like, isn't it great that there are women, isn't it great that there are men? It would just be a person who's elected as a good person. Yes. You won't see that. You won't see that they're gay or the Muslim or the this yeah. or the that. that that's, that's also very divisive. Yeah. So divisive. Yeah. And, not, and, you know, it is. It, it's about a person's character. It's about a person, who they, what they represent and what, they, what their values are and how they treat the other people. I think that is such an important uh, component. And we've got to learn how to be able to trust again. Yes. And learning how to be able to identify people who are going to speak the truth to us. Well, and also <laughs> not to <laughs> not to villainize people who are right. standing up against injustice. Because yeah. again, standing up against injustice is not the same as doing the injustice. So to say, oh, it's wrong on both sides, sometimes it's just not. Right. Sometimes you're just standing up against injustice. Mm-hmm. And that is the correct thing to look into. Not you know, and and I and that's what we see a lot of people say. Oh, well, this one's bad. You know, they're doing they're doing that. They're just as bad as this one. I'm like, no, they're not. Not if they're standing up to say no more hate. Right. Not if they're standing up to say get the KKK out of here. Not if they're standing up to say don't rip a baby out of a mother's arms. Right. That's not hate. That's standing up for injustice. That is totally standing up for injustice. Mm-hmm. And, and this is something. And speaking about Jesus. He wouldn't, <laughs> he wouldn't accept that, all right? That's not what he was about. I can't comment. This is great. Did you know it's only been since 1990, and I did not know this, that women in Congress could wear pants? Wow. Oh, my gosh. What? Whoa. 
Wow, I didn't, I didn't know, know. That's I, great, Karen. Thank, thank you. Thank you. For, uh, wow. wow I, I had no idea. That's, that's pretty amazing. And it's only been since last year that men could wear a dress. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Hey, we're balancing the, the, the sexes already. Huh? We're getting it, like, we're gonna be balanced out here. We're balancing it out. Oh, and this is congrats on uh, your new governor. Keep up, keep standing up. Yes, isn't that amazing? Yeah. I think that's outstanding. Way to go, Colorado. Yeah. Way to go for Colorado to stand up and do what's right and yeah. to vote in the uh, first. You know, I must have been in a vacuum. I did vote for Jared yeah. uh, because I believe in him. But I had no idea he was gay. Would have voted. It wouldn't matter. But I didn't either. I someone said, you liked the first guy? I'm like, we did? <laughs> yeah. Oh, great. That's wonderful. I'm so glad. But, <laughs> no, um, but I just, you know, to me, it wasn't an important issue, so I didn't pay attention to that. Well, that's the whole thing about pay, paying attention to the person's character yeah. and what he, and, and what I thought he was, he was going to give Colorado what I thought was uh, a better direction than I thought, uh, um, uh, uh stable. Stable. Yeah, stable. Me too. And, uh, so I voted for him. I had no idea that he was. Did you vote out slavery? People that was still in our laws. Ooh. I was like, what? what? This is still in our laws? <laughs> yeah. How is that? I know, isn't that weird? Oh, it's it's something we just forgot to do. Oops. Just <laughs> completely <laughs> forgot to do. Oops, we forgot about that. Slavery is still in our laws? <laughs> what? <laughs> anyway, let's talk about, you're going to talk about your happy. Tell me about that. Yes, we're going to talk about what's happiness. You know, uh, there's such a thing. Uh, uh, I'm going to tell um, you, know, one of the things that I like to do on the show is to bring in uh, different uh, perspectives and understandings. About uh, you know life and, and science and psychology and perspectives of, of different people opening up, wanting to be inclusive, wanting to be that place where people can come to learn. Because I think uh, giving counsel is giving grace, uh, you're, you're helping to inspire wisdom and yes, helping absolutely. people. And so a lot of times when we're talking about happiness, what is happy? There's so there's so many people that are doing. Really, Clinical depression is around 40% of America is clinically depressed. Wow, that's huge. 40%. Did that go up in the last couple of years or not? Yeah. No. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> uh, and, and, yeah, and so that's, that's a lot. And, and, it's, and, and the pill is not going to solve the problems. It may mitigate it. It may solve it for a little while. But it's learning about how do we tap into that happiness inside of us. That enables us not to be uh, influenced by the circumstances going around us so that we can stay centered. We can stay inside of ourselves, recognizing that we, in spite of our circumstances, we can find happiness. I have a good friend, Warren Miller, who always mm -hmm. says that stress, which relates to that, yeah. is um, when you give more power to the things outside of you than what's inside of you. Oh, and I think that's yeah. such a powerful statement. You know, yeah. I mean, she, she's wonderful, but that's, that, that's her pillar that one of the pillars she stands on is don't give more power to outside circumstances than you do to what's inside you. Yes. And she's very very uh spiritual. Mm -hmm. And so you know she said you you got what it takes. Don't give it don't let it go. Don't give it outside power. Well but we learn that everything's outside of us. Our it power is. is is outside of us. We look at yes. in, in, in communities and uh, money, relationships, uh, our career and our we have to acquire power, we have to acquire from outside of ourselves. We feel we do. We feel we do. That's the that's the <laughs> misperception is we don't recognize that we have that power within us. Mm -hmm. And how we start to access those things is to take back some of the power that we project it out into the world, in, into our environments, our families, our friends, all those things, and our relationships, and pull it back in, recognizing that every you have a, have you are connected to the creative power of the universe. Every choice that you make has a consequence. Every single choice, and that's when people are like talking about, oh, how you know, being 100% responsible for your life. Well, you, that's it. I'm going to be every choice I make. And the only person who's the, who's in charge of your life is you. This is you. You're that's the it. decider. That's, you're the decider. There's nobody <laughs> else in here. There's, I mean, yeah. unless there's... Yeah. You, that's it. Yeah. And so when I make a choice and recognizing that all those choices have a consequence, you get to be connected to that that part of creation, that act of moving something forward. And, and, and it's a power we all have. But when we... When we surrender it over because we think power is outside of us, we don't get to participate in that. Yeah. Yeah. We let our circumstances control us. We yeah. let our circumstances, our situations, the things that have done to us, uh, and sometimes those things that are, have been done to us require us to look deeply inside of us and say, okay, what can I do differently next time? How much of my past can I let go of? Um, but at the same time, remember enough of it so that I don't make the same mistake again. You know, that's a great one because you want to remember, you don't really want to forget those things because mm -hmm. those things taught you lessons. And hopefully, you learn those lessons and move forward. Even if it took you decades to do it, you know? <laughs> sometimes, sometimes, sometimes it, it does. does. 
you know. Um, so you learn those lessons, but you, but you don't want to relive that situation over mm-hmm. and over and over again. You want to be able to say, okay, take the good, even if it's bad, I take the good out of the bad, and I'll carry that with me, and I'll let the bad just kind of go away, mm-hmm. move all off. And that's hard, I think. And I think that's people that can be internally happy are people that can get up and shake it off. Oh, you know, yeah. Just, I can shake it like that song from Taylor Swift. Shake it. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and I think that's what, I think that's one of the, the most important things is to shake it off and be able to move forward and yeah. forgive. Um, and just move forward. I mean, forgiveness, I think, is a huge part of it. You know? oh. Learning to, learning to <clears> say, <throat> okay, you did this, and I don't care how horrible it was or how bad mm-hmm. it was or whatever. This, you know, it's mm-hmm. done, it's the past, I'm going to move forward, and if you do it again, you don't want to keep going over and over again. But you move forward, and being able to say, I'm going to shake that off and look to the future. I'm not going to look backwards on this. I'm going to take a lesson with me. Mm-hmm. You know, and, mm-hmm. you know, but there's a difference between taking lessons and holding a grudge. Oh my gosh, it is. And, and when we offer, and, and, you know, forgiveness is not the easiest thing to do. I mean, it, it, sometimes it takes work and you get it and you understand it in your mind, but making that transition all the way down to your heart, that's always a, a, a big, big journey that it has to go on. And one of the big keys to understand is that, uh, you know, forgiveness, you've got to be such your own heart. So that you can, you know, that's one of the big things about it is that when you forgive, what ends up happening, you do it for you. Because when somebody hurts you or does something wrong to you and harms you in any kind of way, it awakens in you your capacity to harm another. And that's one of the hardest things to get because you want to point out to that other person, it's you, you did this. Look how ugly I am. That is so true. true. This, I'm this, and you're, you're a horrible human being. And this. But if you really look at it, all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, oh my God. I'm becoming that very and, thing that I'm really against. And that's where, when, when someone has the power to change you like that and you become that, mm-hmm. that's when you lose. Totally. You don't lose because mm-hmm. someone treated you badly, because you can't control how they treat you. Yeah. But you lose when they make you, they make you like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. And it's the, uh, it's the predator. Vengeance is the predator in you. Mm-hmm. It's the part in you that will come out and it will show up and you, it will take over and it will cloud. You know, your judgment, and it will make you the very thing that you uh, that you accuse others of being. And then it's at that point where you got to look at me and say, "Oh my gosh, I, I got I got I got to do something with this." And it becomes about you. It's no longer about the other person anymore. It's Absolutely. got nothing to do with the other yeah, like point anymore. Yeah. You know, and so that's part of it. It's like, wow, I'm I, I'm forgiving you because I've seen what you've awoken up in me, and I can't allow this to be uh, to take over. I know. That's I can't true. Allow that's it to that's take a great over. point, Charles. It's a great point. So it's just part of allowing that to come out and you say, you know what? I'm going to put this away. I'm going to figure out and I'm going to, and I'm going to get through this. And when I come out of this, I'm going to be better than I was before. And I'm not going to let myself get to carry away by this experience. And so I'm going to forgive you because I know what it's leading me to. Right. It's leading you down the same path. And that's you right. Become, you become what you, what you make. That's it. Yeah. It. it takes over. That's a, that's a great description. That's actually a great description of any of those choices you make, or even evil. Mm-hmm. You just become what you don't want. You no, know, you are now. With, with, it just consumes you. With evil, you're you're making a conscious choice, and this is that everybody has this, and that's it. Is that everybody makes a conscious choice to do something that they know is going to harm somebody else, and that they they know, it, or it's that little voice on your shoulder that says, you know, you can have that history. Don't worry, you're okay. Don't worry about it. You know, it's, nobody will know. Yeah. Nobody will know. It's that you know. I mean, <laughs> and we don't listen to it. We know we know better. We don't listen to it. And then when we consciously do something that we know is going to harm somebody else, and we're going to pay the price for it, and nothing stops us from doing it. There's that moment we all have it. I can I can tell you I know. And I look back on my stuff. Oh yeah, we all it, it, when you do something totally stupid. Yes. Or, or, or even worse, you do something that's selfish. Selfish. Totally yeah. selfish, yeah. self serving, yeah. not not caring about what what how that other person how my actions are going to affect another person. I, I did it. I, I and I know there was a moment when I thought, should I do this or not? Or even you do it on yeah. purpose. I mean, yes, you can. Some, work. there are times in your life and I, I like I like to believe and I hope I not do that, but there are times in your life when you're angry, you're upset, mm-hmm. like you said, and you do something to hurt that other person just because you're angry or upset. Mm-hmm. And that and you deliberately do that. And that those are those are bad. You hurt yourself more though. Oh my you god, you hurt yourself. More. Yeah. Um I think that I'm gonna have to run for this thing. That's because, uh, <laughs> no, because I have a I have a uh, 
I, my husband and I are oh. meeting his cousin who also left the country. <laughs> Everyone we know people leaving the country. Everybody um, has it too. And they're in town and they're supposed to meet up at two o'clock. So, oh, so I just dropped in to say hi and have this great conversation. I love your show. Thank you. And it's it's wonderful and it's always right on point. Oh, well, thank great you. Topics. Uh, I'm just so glad you're here. Yeah. Thank you for taking this with you. It's my pleasure, and I will be listening to it in the car on the way. Don't worry about being happy. Well, I, uh, wait, you know, I'll tell you what, Dan Gilbert uh, is a Harvard psychologist and uh, uh, writer of the book um, Stumbling on Happiness, and he's got some really interesting perspectives and understandings about what makes us happy. And uh, so I think it'll be just a great, right. great topic for everyone to, to learn. I'll interject one thing. I'm gonna I believe everybody's born a happy meter. Yeah. A good happy meter. And, mine, and, and some people it's born like this way. Mm -hmm. Those are your people that you know. And then they're happy. Right. And then you got the place. Then you got the sports over here. And I've been very fortunate. That my happy meter is here. It's right. always has been. I'm just a happy person for the most part. And I'm not saying situations and things can't make me unhappy. They do. And then when I do, it's like, whoa! <laughs> but, but then, but, uh, but I certainly, you know, I just think we all have a happy meter and working mm -hmm. on where that, you know, if you just envision the meter, yeah. keeping that somewhere over like this. <laughs> yeah, keep it finding where you're in balance. Yeah. You, you have to learn how to balance yourself so that when life will throw you some circumstances, it's going to knock you down sometimes. Mm -hmm. There's going to be some moments in that you can find ways in order to get yourself back and balance so that you're not overwhelmed by all the stuff that's happening outside of you. Well, listen, it was nice seeing you again. And it was fun. Thank you for inviting me to sit on your show. I appreciate it. It's a great show. Thank you. And uh, I will talk to you later. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs> All right, folks. <clears throat> We're going to take <coughs> a quick announcement break here. That we are broadcasting this show on www.kuhsdenver.com. It's kuhsdenver.com. Uh, broadcasting uh, amazing shows uh, from, uh, from Colorado, Los Angeles, and broadcasting all around the world. Best music programs. you got to listen to Rhonda. She's got a great show on uh, Saturdays. It's uh, WTF. Right? Wasn't that fantastic? Wasn't that fantastic? <laughs> it's pretty much uh, satirical. <laughs> no, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing show. Watch it, please. It's on Saturdays. What's the time? It's on Saturdays? It's on 3 o'clock. 3 o'clock on Saturdays. Um, and uh, today, you know, uh, we're going to just talk a little bit about happiness. Okay, it's uh, there's so many so many things that are going on in the world right now, and it seems to be you know, trying to pull us away from our happiness. And it, and if we don't know how to be able to ground ourselves, to be able to connect to that uh, within us, because joy resonates from within, it comes from our center, it comes from that core of our being. And uh, if you think it's outside of us, we're, we're missing the point. We're, we're, we're losing power. We're losing our sense of being able to master ourselves. And one of the things that we, we all have to do is learn how to master ourselves, learn how to be in control of ourselves, learn how to be able to, 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 to master our thoughts so that what we're saying is we're speaking truthfully, we're speaking honestly, we're speaking with integrity. Our thoughts and our words and our actions match. You want to be in that kind of alignment. But you've got to really get to know yourself. And that's one of those Greek truths that, that came down to us is know thyself. And you want to be, uh, be able to master your passions so that you're not carried away by the, the, the swing of emotions because emotions are unreliable. You can feel one thing one day and you can feel another thing another day and, and about the same topic. So it's really learning how do we master ourselves? How do we get to that place? How do we, what is happiness to us? You know, what does it mean to be happy? You know, I, I find uh, the experiences that I've had have made me extraordinarily happy, but then those moments pass. Well, so how do I stay happy when those moments pass? Uh, being with my family and on, on the holidays and birthdays is, is such a, an important thing. There's so much joy and there's so much love around you. Uh, just a, a gratitude, and then those moments pass. So if we're if we're just living for momentarily for those those the blocks of happiness for us, what are we doing in between? What are we doing in between those those two polarities? Right? Like I I can't be happy until I'm uh, you know the next party or the next uh, experience or the next uh, beloved that comes into my life or, or your life. Uh, you know because when you fall in love, it's a 
fantastic. And then you have those periods where you're you're in between. And uh, how can you stay afloat? And so one of the people we're going to talk about today is Dan Gilbert. And he has the science of why we are happy. Right? And uh, it's one of the things that I, I have my clients that I work with watch is uh, this, this video by Dr. Gilbert. I don't know if he's a doctor, but Dan Gilbert. And he talks about all these different things. And he's, uh, uh, he's a Harvard psychologist and author of the New York Times bestseller called Stumbling on Happiness. And he believes that in our art and pursuit of happiness, most of us have got the wrong, the wrong roadmap. He argues that our beliefs about what will make us happy are often wrong. And that our brains systematically misjudge what will make us happy. And his premise is supported by clinical research drawn from psychology and neuro neuroscience. Now he challenges the idea that we'll be miserable if we don't get what we want. How many feel like you? I'm going to be miserable if I don't get what I want. Right? He proposes that our psychological immune system lets us feel truly happy even when things don't turn out the way we planned. So, why are we happy? Well, about 300,000 years ago, the human brain developed what is called the prefrontal cortex. And this makes us different than every other species on the planet in that it allows us to stimulate, or excuse me, to simulate and imagine. We have this incredible capacity to imagine. And no other species has that. This part of our brain is a simulator. And we can experience imagined experiences in that brain before they actually happen in life. We can test it out in our brains before we act it out in reality. And this is very similar to what test pilots do in the flight simulator. A pilot will practice flying in a simulator before he actually flies a plane. He gets to experiment and work out all the mechanics of flying a plane in a simulator before he actually gets a plane, in a plane and takes off. Now this same concept occurs in our brain when we imagine events in our lives which we would like to experience. We imagine experiences in our mind before they actually happen. Now what the researchers have discovered is there is what's called an impact bias. And what this means is that the simulator in our brain works badly. Now, let me explain what I mean by this. We would expect someone who's won the lottery, right, that 1.6 billion lottery that was just a few weeks ago, uh, to be happier than someone who becomes paraplegic. Now, when Dan Gilbert and his researchers examined this and tested out the happiness scale of people who won the lottery versus someone who's become a paraplegic, what the data shows is that one year later, their happiness measures exactly the same, or about the same. They are equally happy with their lives. So this impact bias is a tendency to overrate the hedonic impact of future events. Hedonic, all right, it's a new word. Hedonic meaning pleasure, feeling good, or happy. So why is this true? Because different outcomes are more different than they actually are. For example, when a person wins or lose an, loses an election, or whether you have a relationship or not, or whether you get a promotion or don't get a promotion, all of these examples have a far less impact, less intensity, and much less duration than people expect them to have. We would expect someone who won an election to be happier than most than the, someone who lost. But a year later, following the election, it turns out that their level of happiness is probably about the same. Now why is this true? Because happiness can be synthesized. Now what do I mean by synthesized? What do I mean by synthetic happiness? All right. Sir Thomas Brown, in 1642, in his work titled 
Religio Medici wrote, I am the happiest man alive. I have that in me that can convert poverty into riches, adversity to prosperity, and I am more invulnerable than Achilles. Fortune hath not one place to hit me. What the hell is he talking about? See, what Sir Thomas knew is that we have this machine in our brain that converts negative experiences and events in our lives to something positive. We human beings have what might be called a psychological immune system. And this is a system of cognitive processes. Largely, these are non-conscious cognitive processes that help us change the view of the world so that we can feel better about the world we live in. We synthesize happiness, but ironically, we think happiness is something not to be found. And now, there is a, are there, and with that, are there examples of people who have been able to find happiness after experiencing challenging and upsetting events in their lives? Who are able to synthesize their happiness and turn lemons into lemonade? Well, I'm going to share a few examples of people who have actually done this. Jim Wright, and this comes from, uh, from Dan Gilbert. Jim Wright was a Democratic congressman in the 1990s. He was chairman of the House of Representatives, and he resigned in disgrace after an up-and-coming Republican named Newt Gingrich found out he'd done this shady book deal. As a consequence, Jim Wright lost everything. Power, prestige, money, and he was the most powerful Democrat at that time. What did Jim Wright, this disgraced congressman, have to say about this years afterwards? He said, and I quote, I am so much better off physically, financially, mentally, and in almost every way. End quote. Here's another example of a man who was able to synthesize his happiness after experiencing what many of us would consider a terrible tragedy. A guy named Morrissey Bickham, Morrissey Bickham, spent 37 years for a crime, <coughs> excuse me, 37 years in prison for a crime he didn't do. After DNA evidence confirmed he was innocent, he was released from prison at the age of 78. Now, what did he have to say about his experience being wrongfully in prison for 37 years? He said, and I quote, I don't have one minute to regret. It was a glorious experience. End quote. He said it was glorious. How could he find being wrongfully in prison for a crime he didn't commit a glorious experience? I bet to, to our minds, I bet that makes absolutely no sense. I mean, that's completely unfathomable. But that was his experience. Here's another example. Pete Best was the original drummer of the Beatles before they dropped him and picked up Ringo Starr and later became the Beatles. He was interviewed in 1994. He was still a drummer, still a musician, still playing music. So what did he have to say? He could have been in one of the best bands ever, the most important bands of the entire 20th century, I mean, the Beatles. He said, and I quote, I'm happier than I would have been with the Beatles, end quote. Yeah, right. <laughs> sure, okay, right, sure. You know, we, I laughed at this. I laughed at this when I heard it. And, and basically what happens is we deduce in our minds that the person didn't really want that job or you're just trying to make a bad situation better or you didn't really have that much in common with your ex fiance and you just figured out that just about the time she threw the ring back in your face. But why do we smirk at other people's ability to synthesize their happiness? Well, we smirk because we think that synthetic happiness is not of the same quality as what we would consider natural happiness. So now we need to define, what is natural happiness? Natural happiness is what we get when we get what we wanted. We get what we wanted, I'm happy. Synthetic happiness is what we make 
when we don't get what we want. Hmm. Now, in our society, we think that synthetic happiness is of an inferior quality. It's a natural happiness. Now, where the heck does this belief come from? Well, what kind of an economic engine that keeps churning over and over again, creating more and more consumers, how could that engine keep going if we believe that not getting what we wanted could make us just as happy as getting what we wanted? Dan Gilbert, when he suggests to us that synthetic happiness is every bit as real, enduring, and of the quality and kind of happiness that you get when you get what you are aiming for. But this kind of happiness is about accepting the things that you cannot change and having the wisdom to recognize them. And here's a bit of irony for you. You know that freedom we all cherish? freedom to make up your mind, to make your choices, and the ability to change your mind, which allows us to choose all these different, beautiful, enticing, delicious futures that we have before us to imagine it. It's the friend of natural happiness. But it is the enemy of synthetic happiness. Synthetic, synthetic happiness works when we recognize there are certain things that we simply cannot change. As Plato says, quote, what is once done can never be undone, end quote. When we can finally accept that, when we can finally accept that, we can engage the psychological immune system to convert that negative experience, that traumatic event, that painful memory, into something more palatable which enables us to gain a healthier perspective of our own lives and find happiness where we are right now. And this psychological immune system works best when we are totally stuck, when we are totally trapped, when we have no other choice but to keep moving forward, to keep moving forward. We have to find a way to be happy within the given circumstances of our lives. Otherwise, we get imprisoned in the what ifs, or I should have done that, or I should have done this, or she, this, she should have done that, he should have done this, I'm a failure, which only prevents us from activating the non-conscious cognitive processes innate to us, which will thus bring us out of the past and into the present happiness. This attribute that we have, which is clinically verified, is something that most people don't know about themselves, and this can work to our disadvantage. There was a study done by Dan Gilbert and his researchers at Harvard where they offered a photography course to the students in which they would take lots of pictures at Harvard, their memories of Harvard, and at the end of the course, the students were given the opportunity to select and keep one of their two best pictures that they had photographed. Now, the purpose behind this study was to understand the psychology underlying the unanticipated joy of being totally stuck. The students were asked to participate in this photography course, and at the end of the course, they were going to get to choose two of, the, of their best pictures, and one of them they would get to keep. The other they would have to relinquish. For half the class, Dan and his group told the students, they could change their mind. They had the freedom to change their mind, and they had up to four days to do that. The other half of the class, we was told that once they chose the picture, that was it. The other picture was being sent away right after class mailed off to England somewhere. The students had no option to change their mind. So the decision was for half the class reversible, four days to make a swap, when the other half was irreversible. They could never swap. The students were asked whether they could predict their satisfaction three days after or they could go away uh, with the results, uh, excuse me, and report what their satisfaction was in three days and then again in six days. And what the results were was that those who could not change their minds really liked the picture that they chose. This group's satisfaction actually increased. However, those students who had the option of deliberating, who had the freedom to choose, didn't like their picture. Is this the right one? Did I, did I choose the right one? Did I, 
I, well, I think I like the other one. No, wait, wait. I think I like this one better. What do you think? They had this constant turmoil going back and forth inside of them, in their minds, as to which picture was better. It made them not like the picture they chose. And even after the opportunity to swap the picture, ex the pictures expired, they still didn't like the picture that they chose. <laughs> Why? This occurred because the reversible condition is not conducive to the, to the synthesis of happiness. So then his researchers conducted another study similar on a group of Harvard students a little bit later, and in the study they asked the students which photo uh, photography course they would take. A course where their choice of their two best pictures at the end would be reversible or irreversible. 66% chose the reversible course, where they would have the option to deliberate on which of their two pictures they wanted to keep, not realizing, of course, based on the previous study, they will ultimately be deeply dissatisfied with their picture, because they did not know the conditions under which synthetic happiness grows. Now Shakespeare said, and uh, I love Shakespeare, uh, there's nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. <laughs> uh, what paradox, right? Now, how does that make sense? Is that really true? Is it just about thinking about is really nothing good or bad? And only our thoughts really make it bad or make it good? Well, Dan Gilbert makes a very salient point about this idea towards the end of his video, which I'll share with you now. He says that, yes, there are some things better than others, and we should have the preferences that lead us to one future or another. No question. But when these preferences drive us too hard or too fast, because we have overrated the differences between these two futures, we are at risk. When our ambitions are bounded, it leads us to work joyfully. And when our ambitions are unbounded, it leads us to lie, cheat, to steal, to hurt others, to sacrifice things of real value. When our fears are bounded, we are prudent, cautious, thoughtful, considerate, and kind. And yet, when our fears are unbounded and overblown, we can be reckless and we can be cowardly. End quote. Boy, he sure leaves us with a lesson to be gained at the end of this video, uh, which I really want you to get. You know, he says our longings and our worries are both set to some degree overblown because we have within us the capacity to manufacture the very commodity we are constantly chasing when we choose experience. Life sometimes gives us experiences that are challenging to overcome. Sometimes we don't get a chance to choose what happens to us. But we do get to choose how we handle it and how we deal with it. When we refuse to take in these events and process them, and instead suppress them, it does major psychological, emotional, and spiritual damage to our minds. You know, when any kind of uh, abuse or violence or trauma or PTSD, or, or you're dealt a heavy hand. And your souls are in trouble. You know, there's a big gaping hole inside of you that we can be very you can paralyze you. And it can keep you from finding your way out of uh, the negativity, out of the pain, and retrieve the joy of your own existence that you once had. But now, with this work and understanding from Dan Gilbert, we have a power. We actually have a power within us that is able to convert those traumas and those experiences and those memories and all those things that have happened to us and convert those things. Because trauma, whenever you have trauma and you ever have drama, you've got to look at the truth. Trauma is deceit. Trauma is, is, is asking you to look deeper to find that, and you've got, and we can convert those traumas in our lives and enable us to find the good, and thus we'll be able to make peace with the past, which ultimately allows us to synthesize our happiness, so we can then build towards a better future. We are able to do this through our psychological immune system that Dan is talking about, that is already built into us, that all these uh, people in history were talking about. Now, if we allow it to freely function without our interference, if we understand it and recognize its value in our lives, we can fundamentally change how we view 
the negative events that happen to us. It's a choice. My God, it's a choice. I, I, this year has been such an important um, year for me to understand the power of choice, the power of how to, to build our self-esteem, the power of, of our connection to creation, and our ability to connect to that. And uh, it's really learning how to be 100% responsible. When people say being 100% responsible for your life, it's about learning that every choice you make has a consequence. I've made all those choices, and now that I understand the power that is within me, I'm going to esteem myself to make better choices. And, and that's the things that is so important to understand. It's, it's your ability to connect to that which within you empowers you and ennobles you. We have the freedom. Okay, again, this is a choice. We can we can stay stuck. We keep can keep reliving the pain, the traumas, the abuse, the memories. And it's important to talk it out. It's important to process. It's important to do the rituals, the transformation, all that. And we need to take the time to transform that and to to, to heal from that. But you've got to want to heal. You've got to want to heal. Don't be don't be addicted to healing. Just get in, in, in you know, really to be determined. To walk that path and you're going to do whatever it takes to be free of it. And you got to allow this built-in mechanism that's within your mind, within my mind, within your mind, um, to convert that trauma, that pain, that violence, that memory, and to turn it into some, something good, to turn your suffering into wisdom. And we've got to recognize and own the power that we have within us to convert all of that, which has happened to us, into fertilizer, where we plant new seeds and grow into the people we are capable of becoming. And these traumas and pains can serve as fertilizers to becoming the best version of ourselves. And you've got to take the time to cultivate that new self who's emerging, attending to the wounds, healing them, and being healed. And you've got a mechanism already tapped into you to be able to synthesize your happiness. Give, your, give yourselves permission to use it. And, uh, and remember that these feelings of happiness, they, they can be, you can do it. Tap into that joy. When you're being alive and being who you want to be, and you've got to be you. You've got to be you. There's only one you. And when, you, when you're just happy being you, you don't need anybody else's approval. My gosh, that is freedom. That is total freedom. And, and then you're, you know, then, then things will happen in your life that you never believe were going to start happening. And you'll start the, that whole world, your whole world outside of you will start to mirror back what you feel on the inside, and that will happen more and more. And so you're going to be going beyond your limitations that you've imposed upon yourself. And as this traumas and begin to continue to diminish, and you'll have this power to be able to walk through life knowing that I can always connect to my happiness. I know in my joys that nothing can defeat me. Nothing. And that's empowering. And that's fantastic. And that's what I want for you. All of you who are listening in from all around the world, listening to my show, which I can't thank you all enough for tuning in. It's uh, incredible. We are broadcasting live from uh, KUHSDenver.com. That's KUHSDenver.com. And uh, it's such an, uh, an honor to be, uh, be speaking with all of you. Uh, we're touching people's lives uh, on every continent. It's incredible. And the numbers for the show continue to rise. And it's, uh, uh, you know, I'm just really humble and grateful to all, each and every one of you. I want to talk a little bit about some things really quick about how to let go of things that no longer serve you. This is part of that way to be able to tap into that happiness that you can utilize in your life right now and to, to synthesize the events that have happened, but synthesize your happiness, knowing that you have that psychological immune system inside of you. But you've got to learn some things on how to let go. And we hold on to so many things. You know, we hold on to a lot of past. I'm guilty of it. I totally am. You know, <laughs> I, I have a, a very strong capacity to hold on to things. I know that. Um, and I'm learning. But we cling on to these things. And you can start today to be able to, to change it. And, and here are some things. These are 15 things that you can utilize today to be able to help yourself. Number one is to give up your need to always be right. It's a tough one. You know, there's so many of us who just can't stand the idea of being wrong. And we're wanting to always be right. I got to be right. You know, and even at the expense of ending relationships that are causing a great deal of stress and pain, you know, for us and others. And it's just, it's just not worth it. You know, 
whenever you feel the urge to be to jump into a fight or wanting to get into an argument, uh, who's right, who's wrong, just ask yourself this question. Would I rather be right or would I rather be kind? This comes from Wayne Dye. The, uh, uh, the great one by who passed recently. Now, what difference will that make? You know, ask yourself. Second is to give up your need for control. Be willing to give up your need to control everything that happens around you, whether they are situations, events, people, and it doesn't matter who they are. You know, workers, co-workers, strangers, family, loved ones, just allow them to be. Allow everyone and everything to be exactly as it is. And just watch how much better you are going to feel. And you're not having to control anybody. This is this destroys relationships. This is it just destroys it. You could have something that is so incredible, so perfect, so good, and then you want to control it. And you, and you destroy it. You can absolutely destroy it. I, I'm in one of the classes that I teach, my God. I was teaching a class last night with people who were, uh, you know, I teach a class for, to help people recover, recover from their divorces, set their parenting plans for their children. And so many have, you know, are dealing with power and control issues. Give up. If you want a healthy relationship in the future, you've got to give up your need for control. Allow the other person to be who they are. And you get to be that as well. It's got to be reciprocal in that way. Then you've got the seeds planted that could have germinate and grow into something that is absolutely incredible for you. But you've got to be able to do that. Now, by letting it go, it all gets done. The world is won by those who let it go. When you try and try, the world is beyond winning. This is Lao Tzu. Number three, give up on blame. Oh my gosh. Give up on your need to blame others. And it is so easy to blame others for what you have or don't have, for what you feel and what you don't feel. Blame is the discharge of pain and discomfort. Blame is taking your, giving your power away to somebody else, making them responsible. And it's a lack of self-responsibility and a lack of self-accountability. Stop blaming other people. Stop giving your power away. From this moment on, you are not allowed to blame anybody else for the, the, the problems that you have in your life. From this moment on, be just take your power back. I'm here. To, I'm I'm empowering myself. I'm no longer blaming anybody else for the things that have happened and, and what I've done in my life. And then you're you're because then you're becoming responsible for you. You've got to be obligated to you first. You can't give to anybody else unless you're doing taking care of you first. Number four. Give up on your self-defeating talk. Now, this is a big one. How many of us are hurting themselves right now, repeating all these negative, polluted, and repetitive thoughts, self-defeating mindset? You know, you, 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 we do it. We talk to ourselves. We feed ourselves. We say these terrible things about ourselves. We wouldn't say these things to a best friend. We wouldn't say it to, and you've got to be your best friend. You just have to. You, you're, you've got to be your best friend 24-7. You've got to be with you 24-7. you better be your best friend all your life. You'll be taking your uh, your soul with you. I'm going to get to a great story uh, before we close the, the show on that. So give up on your self-defeating talk. You know, here's a rule of thumb. Don't believe anything that the mind tells you, especially if it's negative and self-defeating. You are always better than that. Eckhart Tolle says that the mind is a superb instrument if used rightly. Used wrongly, and it becomes very destructive. Number five. Give up on your limiting beliefs about what you can or can't do, about what is possible or impossible. From now on, you're no longer going to allow your limiting beliefs to keep you stuck in the wrong place. Spread your wings and you fly. And surround yourself with people who want to see you fly. Go, you've got talent, you've got, you, you've got some gifts, go out there, go get it. Be around people who support you in that. The belief is not an idea held by the mind. It is an idea that holds the mind. It's Ellie Rosalie. Number six, give up your complaining. Give up your constant need to complain about those many, many things in your life. People, situations, events, past that make you have unhappy, sad, and depressed. Nobody can make you unhappy. No situation can make you sad or miserable unless you allow it to, unless you give them permission to. 
It's not the situations that trigger those feelings in you, but how you choose to look at it. Okay? Never, ever underestimate the power of your attitude and the way you think about it, yourself and your situations. Number seven, give up the luxury of criticism. The luxury of criticism. Give up your need to criticize everything, people or, or, or events that are different from you. Decide to put yourself in their shoes. Relax and say, what's, why, why does this person tick? What makes them do the things that they do? Why? why? And, and, and we're all different. We're all the same at the same time. <laughs> we're all uniquely connected to this infinite interconnectedness. We all came to have our own unique expression while being interconnected to something that is much greater than all of us. We all want to be happy, and we all want to love, and be loved and be understood and to understand. We all want something, and something is wished by all. Number eight, give up your need to impress others. Oof, this is the ego. Stop trying so hard to be something that you are not just to make other people like you. And this is one of, for me, huge people pleaser. Right? It doesn't work that way. The moment you stop trying so hard to be something that you are not, the moment you just start taking off all your masks, the moment you accept and embrace the real you, you know what? The real people that you regard need to be in your life, they will find you. People will be drawn to you effortlessly. Number nine, give up your resistance to change. Sometimes change is good. Sometimes change is healthy. That's an eternal constant. That's one of those really huge, big, 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 big truths. Change is constant. Right? And you've got to accept it. The more you can, the more it will help you to make improvements in your life and all the lives around you. Follow your bliss. Embrace change. Don't resist it. Now, one of my favorite authors is Joseph Campbell, and he writes, quote, follow your bliss. And the universe will open doors for you where there were only walls. End quote. Number 10, give up on labels. Stop labeling those things, people, or events that you don't understand as being weird or different, and try opening your mind. Just a little, little by little. If it's too much, take a step back. Just open little by little. Miracles only work when the mind is open. And Wayne Dyer says, quote, The highest form of ignorance is when you reject something you don't know anything about. End quote. Number 11, give up on your fears. Fear is just an illusion. It doesn't exist. You create it. I create it. A lot of it's in our mind. 90% of it is definitely in our minds. Correct the inside, and everything else starts falling into place. Number 12, give up on your excuses. We make a lot of them. Take your excuses, send them packing, tell them they are fired. Go put your head in the toilet for seven minutes. Right? You don't need them anymore. A lot of times we limit ourselves because of the excuses we use all the time. Right? And instead of growing and working on improving our lives, we just stay stuck. And we lie to ourselves. <laughs> we use all kinds of excuses. And excuses that are 99% times, 99 times unreal. So don't give up on your excuses. Number 13, give up on the past. Give up, excuse me, give up the past. And it's a big one. It's a tough one. Gosh, I know it. All right. It took me a long time to get to where I am today to be able to say these things to you. So I'm only telling you things that I've done. You know, I think one of the things that people need to know is that or you should only teach what you know. You shouldn't teach what you don't know. Because how can you tell people to do something if you haven't done it yourself? I think that's crazy. But it is tough, giving up the past. And you're doing little by little, again. Especially when the past looks so much better than the present and the future looks so frightening. But you got to take into consideration the fact that the present moment is all there is. It's all you have. You've got to go moment by moment. The past that you're longing for, it's gone. It's gone. Okay? past that you were dreaming about was ignored by you when you were there, when you were present in that moment, it's gone. All right? So stop deluding yourself. Be present in everything that you do and enjoy your life. Enjoy your life. Life is a journey. It's your life, not a destination. Okay? Have a clear vision for your future. Prepare yourself, but always in the present of the now. In that present now. Number 14, give up attachment. Now this concept is a hard one to grasp. Giving up attachment. I have to let go 
uh, of things, but it's not possible. It's impossible. It's, it's taking the personal and making it impersonal. It's making it seem the universal experience in the particular. That, uh, a universal experience like, uh, you know, a, a, a betrayal or abandonment or some things like that. Those are universal. And, and when we can impersonalize it, rather than personalizing it, we grow from it. We're no longer held hostage to it. We, we, we have more compassion for others who are going through it. We've experienced it. We get the lessons that we need to get. So we've got to give up those attachments. You get better and better at it with time and practice. I'm still learning too. But the moment you detach from all things, now this doesn't mean that you stop loving people or you give up your love or you, because uh, love and attachment have nothing to do with one another. And attachment comes from a place of fear. I'm, very, I'm afraid I'm going to lose this. And uh, while love, real love, is pure, it's kind, and it's selfless. It's peaceful. There's, when there's love, just, there, there can't be fear because the attachment, uh, uh, fear and attachment and love cannot coexist. You become very peaceful, you become very kind, you become very tolerant, serene, and you will eventually get to a place where you'll be able to understand all things without even trying. You know, you know, it's a state beyond words. Number 15, last thing, give up your living up your life for, up to other people's expectations. Stop living for others and their expectations of you. Way too many people are living a life that is not theirs to live. And who are we to, stay, to try to tell someone they ought to come and do and live a life that we want them to live because that's going to make us feel bad? Everyone has their path. We have to help them out. Their life, they live their lives according to what other people think is best for them. They live their lives according to what their parents think is best for them. They live their lives according to what their enemies, their teachers, their government, their media, their beloveds, this, and they ignore their inner voice. They ignore that inner calling. That so, because they're so busy pleasing uh, everybody else with living up to other people's expectations, that they lose control of their own lives. They forget what makes them happy. They forget what they want, what they need, and eventually they forget all about themselves. Folks, you have one life. You've got this one. You've got just this one right now. You've got to live it. You've got to own it. And especially, you got to don't allow anybody else or other people's opinions or detract you from your own path. So these are the things that I recommend you to letting go. And I want to leave. I know we're just slightly over. Uh, I just want to leave you with one story. Uh, it's kind of one of these uh, um, fable stories. Great. Uh, one of my dear friends sent me it. From, uh, uh, let me just share it with you, and I think it uh, kind of will uh, be the closer for today's show. There was a, a king, and he had four wives, and he was about to die. And so the king was afraid of death, but afraid of walking into the afterlife. And so he was, uh, you know, asked his fourth wife, which he, he loved the most. And he loved her. And he spent gold on her, and diamonds, and jewelry, and all kinds of uh, riches on him, and uh, asked the, uh, his, what, his fourth wife, would you uh, go with me into the afterlife? And uh, his fourth wife says, no, I can't. He just walked away. So then he went to his third wife, this king, this old king who was about ready to die. He went up to his third wife and he says, no, would you, uh, would you walk into me with me into the afterlife? Would you go with me? And he loved his third wife. He loved his third wife. He showed her his third wife off at parties and events and situations. And his third wife came back to him and said, you know, uh, I love my life too much. You know, and, and when you die, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go off and I'm going to remarry. And the king was really disheartened and, uh, you know, felt bad, felt sad. So he went to his second wife. Now the second wife had been with him the whole time, cared for him, looked after him, wanted Always when he was sick, was there by his bed, and, 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 and really it was, anytime the king was in need, his second wife was there. And uh, so he asked the second wife, you know, you, uh, would you go with me to the afterlife? And the second wife says, you know, I will, I will take care of you, I will walk you, I will set up your funeral, I'll put everything together, but it's, when you die, that's as, that's as far as I can go, I can't go with you farther than that. And then he goes to his first wife. And his first wife came to him. 
and said, I'll go with you. I'll go with you into the afterlife. I'll take, I'll, I'll be with you every step. You want to die, we'll, we'll walk together. And he was, and the king was like, well, you know what? I, you're the one I treated the worst. You're the one who I was, the, the, who I neglected the most, who I didn't cherish the most. I didn't do anything with you. And you want to go with me? And the, the, the old king was so ashamed. Now we all have four wives. We all have four wives. Four husbands. You can say husbands too. The fourth wife is your body. It's your body. We, we dress it, we cover it, put on new clothes, but when we die, we can't take away. We can't take away. It's as far as we go. But we give it most of our attention. Third wife is our possessions. Our money, our possessions, uh, all those things that we accumulate over time. And when we die, uh, we don't take our possessions and they remarry. They get divided, we get split up, we get sent out. Uh, and we give so much of our attention to our third wife. Our second wife is our family and friends, our loved ones. Right? They're with us through our times of need. They, they show us true love. They, 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 they are with us so when we, we need them most. But the farthest they can go to is the king yes, to, uh, to the moment when we pass. And our first wife, our first wife is our soul. My first wife is the, the soul that goes with us when we walk on, when we leave this life. And so we all have a, and we, we tend to it the least. So, you gotta, you gotta take care of your soul. You gotta take care of that which is gonna go with you when you leave this, this plane of existence. You gotta meditate. And you gotta pray. You go to church, pray, and, and be surrounded by people who, who, uh, who can hold you up, the community. You gotta nurture those aspects of your soul because that's a part of you that's gonna always be with you. And happiness comes in your soul. Happiness comes from the soul. When you know your soul, when you know yourself, your life is yours. All right, folks, thank you so much for tuning in. I know we went over just a little bit today on the council. Uh, we had a uh, beautiful guest, Rhonda. Thank you, Rhonda, so much. I know you're listening to and for joining me. I love that conversation that we had. Uh, it was impromptu and uh, really uh, added so much uh, benefit and grace to the, the people who are tuned into the council. And I uh, just want to thank each and every one of you for being here. I want to thank uh, KUHSDenver.com uh, for hosting this show, for being the platform where we can broadcast to all of you all around the world. And all around this great nation, and uh, it's just a really an honor and privilege. And thank you, KUH Denver, KUHS Denver. Uh, tune in to this station. We've got the best music, the best programs, and the best shows. Uh, and it's getting better and better, getting better and better. So, uh, And we've got shows that reach out to every community, every segment. So if you, if, uh, if you, if you want to tune in to, to something that's innovative, progressive, understanding, uh, and wise tune into this station. All right, folks. Thank you so much. I'm Charlie Pacello, your host of the council. The council is adjourned. May you all be well. May you all be free of pain and suffering. May you all be whole. We'll be back again in about uh, two or three weeks. We've got some great guests that are coming up, lined up. You don't want to miss it. God bless you. And we'll see you soon. Thank you, folks. Again, on the international camera, we will be back in a couple of weeks here on the council. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege. And uh, again, uh, have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Bye bye.